Al government said they are going to review the whole middle way policy. Um, so that that is also uh, going to come under scanner. So um, you know, somebody who always spoke for independence, uh, I'm very happy with this decision because it's a very clear cut, and um, it's not now going to be dependent on on China. Because the basic difference between autonomy and independence um, is this: in auton in demanding for autonomy, you have your hand stretched in front of China and say, give us autonomy. And if they do not give, your hand, hand is still empty and there. And we have been like that in the past, for the past 30 years, mainly on the insistence of, 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 of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And now, when we say independence, uh, independence is not some uh, freedom, independence. It's not what you beg. It's something what you do and make by your own effort. You are no longer dependent on the adversary. We, by our, our own effort, we will do it. But as I said earlier, there is no compromise, second thought about nonviolence. So we will be nonviolent, but we will be aggressive, confrontational. We will be there where the injustice is. Uh, so therefore, I think the whole working of the um, of the freedom struggle will be now, from now on. Uh, much more confrontational and and will be di uh, will be different, and um, uh, and I think uh, that uh, with this uh, and much more participation from the youngsters, uh, even in Tibet, it's very clear that wherever you saw, whether you've seen uh, uh, these uh, video images, news clips, or even photographs, mostly the leaders, people who are organizing, are youngsters. And even in exile, it is, it is the same, uh, same scenario. A lot of youngsters are completely convinced that with, because for us, independence, without independence, we cannot guarantee the continuation of the Tibetan nation, the Tibetan religion and the culture. Nothing can guarantee the survival of the Tibetan nation other than independence. And we have seen East Turkestan is a very good example. East Turkestan used to be an independent country, is, a, is an Islamic country country of the Uyghur people, uh, which is uh, enjoying, in, in, in Chinese definition, autonomy. But, uh, you know, it's a complete failure. Look at Inner Mongolia. Inner Mongolia, I mean, who can deny the whole history and pride history of, of Mongolians? But today, Inner Mongolia, part of Mongolia, is under China, and there, 85% of the population today are Chinese. And, uh, you know, people don't speak uh, Mongolians anymore whole Mongolian culture is dead. It's all shopping malls and discotheques and uh, guest houses and um, off the road, uh, you know, take away, Chinese takeaways. So there's no identity of the Mongolians in Inner in, in Mongolia today. So therefore, and they're supposed to be enjoying autonomy. And Manchuria, another case, uh, the railways were built even before 1950s. And they're, they're, uh, it's completely flooded by, by Han Chinese. And Mongolians were the because the Manchurians were the one who were actually ruling over uh, Han China. They were they were the one who built uh, the capital of Peking, uh, which is now called Beijing. They were the one. But today they are completely flooded by Chinese population. And it's a very, mm, I mean, um, Austri uh, uh, in the history of Europe, you know, it's a very, uh, it uh, it has always been a very effective strategy by the colonial powers, how they use population flooding to homogenize the culture and therefore completely smother it and make it hopeless. And this is uh, uh, an attempt that Ch uh, China is doing in Tibet. Um, are, there any signs in, are, are there any signs in China, within China, where you can see, well, not on political level, also on political level, but also on an intellectual level, on an artist level, where you can see something is happening also within China. I mean, our experience in working on this exhibition is that, yes, there are very small <laughs> developments. Um, but what is your experience in that? And then maybe another question I would have is, also, what is um, the relationship between the exile community and the Tibetans in Tibet? Um, you know, who are you speaking for? It sometimes seems um, that the exile community is rather disconnected from the Tibetans within Tibet. 
Um, sometimes it seems that there are ties, that there, there is a certain exchange of, of will and of sort of democratic processing. That's a very sort of fragile and uncertain territory for me. Um, very, very important question, and I think, I think there are huge gray areas we need to cover today. I mean, I'm very happy you asked me, asked me this question, because a lot of times uh, there, were, there were these easy, simplistic uh, judgments. Uh, are the Tibetans inside Tibet and outside related or not? Question number one. If they are related, are the Tibetans in exile uh, responsible for having incited the protests in Tibet? Therefore, Dalai Lama should be held responsible. You know, these kind of simplistic uh, logistics, people, people ask these questions. Because I, I think when you are not really aware and know the gray areas, um, it is very difficult to make a, a, a judgment, a proper understanding of it. Um, so I'll answer this question first, and the, uh, the first one later. Um, when China explained the protests the uprising in Tibet, they immediately threw it, uh, blamed the Dalai Lama on this. They said it is the Dalai Lama and the exiled Tibetans who incited uh, this kind of protest. Now, supposing if, if the protest was by one man, two, two youngsters, or maybe at one, one city, or maybe one group, or maybe a hundred, or maybe take it, 1,000 Tibetans did it. Maybe we can say, okay, it was incited by people. But when it happened all over Tibet, when everybody took part in the protest, that kind of judgment should be questioned. How can, how can somebody from outside Tibet and inside everybody in Tibet to rise up? And therefore, the bigger question is this. It's a very colonial uh, judgment by saying that Tibetans inside Tibet needed to be incited by somebody outside and can never think on their own. Therefore, it is a very condescending judgment to say that Tibetans inside Tibet cannot think, they cannot make decisions, they cannot uh, come out, they cannot protest, they cannot do anything logical, reasonable, reasonable that they needed to be incited by somebody outside. They are basically animals. This is the basic assumption. And I, therefore, I question Chinese uh, blaming the Dalai Lama for this. And, you know, for China, uh, there are more reasons. They portrayed this protest in Tibet as a rioting and arsoning. And for them, there is a reason for, to do that too. Because only by portraying the protests in Tibet as a rioting and arsoning can they use and justify the use of violence and police and army. And yet, the world all over, there was an outcry when the Chinese used the violence. Because no uh, military crackdown is justified for, for any kind of protest. I mean, protests have, happens all over the world. Any kind of disagreement, there are protests. But how can they continue to do this? They were trying to divert the issue of the Tibetans raising the issue of independence to that of internal problem. That the Tibetans were arsoning, so we clamped it down. And then present that Tibetans, uh, the issue of Tibet, issue of the protest, is about violence and arsoning. It's not about independence. So they were trying to divert the issue from the real issue of the Tibetans uh, demanding independence to that of arsoning and rioting. And then assume that the Tibetans inside Tibet cannot think they needed to be incited, um, infused, and encouraged from outside. So I think these are imp really, really uh, important things that we uh, need to understand and have, have a better understanding. Are there relationship between Tibetans inside Tibet and outside? Yes, and why not? Because we are brothers and sisters and family and friends of Tibetans who are living inside Tibet. And how can there be no relationship? In fact, it is because we were living outside, we got cut in certain other ways. Because uh, my mother's Half of her family are still are in Tibet, and when they escaped Tibet, many of them today 
they completely lost their touch. And my mother has been living in India for the past 50 years. And she does not know whether her uh, 